B. Krillitop virus is a virus that's like globally found in tons of different crops. It's just one of those viruses that are super common and can go to, get into a lot of species. And this beet leafhopper is like basically the only vector of this virus. And I was wondering, do you think these bugs are, more bugs are being attracted into the area because the soil is being depleted of trace minerals? There's so much background infrared radiation already that it would make it very difficult to sort of take it, sort of see it. There'd be a lot of what we basically visual noise or perhaps vibrational yeah, interference. Noise. There's a silverleaf whitefly out there. It's a very common pest and it's a super vector of over 480 plant viruses uh, known. And um, there's a virus that it um, transmits and it actually changes the bias that it has for yellow leaves. What is ecology? You're here with Mark Batwell and Matthew Gates on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook. Our $2.99 membership is available on the join button below. And if you need a little more one-on-one, -on -one, our VIP link is down below in every video description. First off, Matthew, pleasure to have you on the Perfect Gardens TV. I would love it if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started and, and some of your passions. Yeah, sure, no problem. So my name is Matthew Gase. I'm an integrated pest management specialist, but I also like to describe my, my sort of strategy as like a holistic IPM, one that kind of looks at uh, various aspects of things like ecology and, and how in the natural environment, plants and microbes and um, other organisms like what we'd call pests sort of interact. And I use that information to sort of um, assist people with trying to mitigate or prevent pests from um, affecting them in the first place. And there's a bunch of different ways people can do that, but that's where I sort of couch uh, with um, research and also with um, experiential situations. So just to kind of regurgitate what you're saying a little bit. So basically you use natural predators to, to fight the pests that we don't want in the garden. That's uh, one aspect of it, but yes, definitely. Okay. That's really interesting. The, let's go from all of... areas. I was saying he, he likes to come from all different areas. So that's what's really cool about Matthew is he, he attacks from all different types of areas of thought process, kind of like you. It, it leads really into our first question was uh, recommend your recommended form to IPM surrounding indoor and outdoor, which is really what I'd love for you to dive into. And yeah, tell us what your thought process is around that stuff. So like, for example, if you have, um, obviously if you're cultivating somewhere, you're cultivating in a place, right? Like, and so that location is going to have, you know, various sort of biases um, that will change your experience, right? Like, for example, if you're growing in a place where you uh, don't really have like a winter, you know, or like a really cold winter, um, that's going to be very different. Pest dynamics are going to be different for the ambient level of various like insects or, you know, pathogens, like when the seasons change and it becomes very wet, you know, certain things become more likely that you're going to encounter them. Or if you grow near a place where there's a lot of um, traditional industrial agriculture, that's going to sort of, um, you know, you're more likely to see certain kinds of pests and especially ones that are common for the crops that you're uh, growing next to, for example. So you look at all these different contexts about your your place, whether you're growing commercially or in a home grow situation. This is, of course, very important. You know, things like what are the plants that are growing on your uh, property? Uh, there are many situations where I've um, talked to people who they don't, um, like they're getting, they have a pest like rice root aphids, for example. And um, they might not be aware of the fact that the rice root aphid doesn't just feed on like cannabis plants. It can feed on and does alternate between various kinds of hosts, like certain grasses and herbaceous plants, and also like tree-like plants, like um, like prunus species, like nectarines and, and almonds and things like that. And, that. and that family, that sort of genus of trees. And lo and behold, they happen to be near an orchard or they happen to be, you know, there's a lot of like rye, grass and wheat and, and rice or, or some sort of wild plant that's just a weed that's just growing near their property. And even though they, they clean out their whole cultivation space, they keep getting reinfested because it's right outside their door. So just things like this can be like uh, incredible game changers, even though they're 
actually kind of um sort of, sort of a basic thing but like when you know that ecology it just allows you to make a much more wise decision and it, it gives you informed consent about how are you going to attack your 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 problem as you were talking one thing kind of just pops into mind and and i'm like infantile as when as i listen to you a little bit but whenever i notice that let's say it's we're five six weeks into, into flowering and out here in colorado we always get one snow in September, right before October, right? And right when we get that one snow, even if I, if, if and I'm doing outdoor greenhouse, even though I put a uh, shade cloth and a plastic over to protect it from the, this one s- snow that will come in, drop below, and then, and then evaporate away literally within a day or two, white flies always come three days later right after that. You know, and that's kind of like as in, in my mind, as you say, ecology, is that kind of like what you're describing as your, you're, you're forecasting certain types of pests to follow specific type of uh, environmental events as well. And Absolutely. As, okay. I gave one example right there with the white flies is something I observed. Have you ever, is there other bugs that, I don't want to say it was specific with white flies, but is there other bugs that seem to follow around uh, weather events uh, that you've noticed uh, in your area and other areas specifically for outdoor growing? Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, I often hear people exclaim that they like people have been growing for like five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. You know, cannabis safe, was a big one and rice root aphid to a degree as well that I've heard a lot of people say that they never had to deal with any of that. Now, there could be a bunch of different reasons for that. Maybe they were using some uh, insecticidal products that they can't or don't use anymore because they're quite toxic and systemic in the tissue. But I think a lot of it is because of just the general context of not just the environment, but also our socially what we're growing. More people are growing. It's much more open uh, in in various places, at least uh, to various degrees. And also we've just had more time, sort of like incubation time. So um, even a specialist like the cannabis is going to become more common for that reason. Its host is becoming more uh, transported globally, but also like in the United States and things like that. Then on top of that social context, you've got what you're saying, the sort of environmental context as well. Like, you know, if you don't, even in a place that ha- gets a terrible winter, right, that would normally kill these aphids, um, although they can produce like an egg that's supposed to overwinter. So like that is possible. There could be some that eke out in existence, but um, we still have like people who are growing indoors and in greenhouses and you get this sort of like, Darwin's finches situation, where uh, they kind of are able to exist in these little islands that allow them that just insulate them from the weather, just like us in our in our homes. And so that's going to also have a, a strong impact where perhaps you wouldn't have had that before. When people, so they can have like a little breeding hub almost. Exactly right. And, and it's kind of like a safe haven. Okay. And um, like, for example, a lot of fungi I feel like uh, a, a lot of fungal pathogens become much more common, also oomycetes for that matter, when it's like wintry or autumnal, when you get like a lot of the rains in certain parts of the world. Like I live in Southern California, so maybe I'm biased because I find those weather patterns really cool because we never get them. <laughs> never, you know, I rarely get to experience it, perhaps that's why. But it's true. Like I get, I have a massive appreciation for like even just a little bit up north of the Pacific Northwest you know, is a lot more, uh, there's a lot more cool stuff going on. Like diverse. Um, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a definitely a big role to play in what environment you're growing. I know people who grow out in the desert, in the high desert. So they get a lot of insects at night. There's a lot of cool desert insects going around doing stuff, other arthropods, but they also kind of have a lot of just scrag, scraggy kind of like, you know, not really like voluptuous leaves and lush blood is being grown in the middle and in, in the mountainous desert. But um, yeah. so in some ways they don't get the same pests and, and that's been a real big boon for them. If that makes sense, you know, I mean, Arizona outside is hard. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, and another good thing to keep in mind is like you're saying through the legalization through more and more States, this is going to cause more and more people to share clones, be more comfortable sharing clones, 
and just, you know, the transportation of clones alone, I've heard so many people, oh, I got to clone off my buddy and then their whole, their tents in their basement are now infected. So, you know, through the legalization and the normalization of cannabis, I would expect to see a lot more of this stuff to come through. So you, we need to be conscious of where we're getting our products, our clones, you know, where we're sourcing our soils and stuff to keep in mind, because it's, it's probably just, just starting to get amped up is how I view it. In a lot of yeah, ways, that is the horror case. stories. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure everyone on this panel is already familiar with like the massive anxiety over like hot latent viroid, for example. Many people I know have been uh, really damaged by like also some of the viruses that are coming up, like a uh, B. curly top virus, for example. Mark made a great uh, question about, you know, certain pests coming in, becoming more problematic at certain times of the year. And B. curly top virus is a virus that's like, globally found in tons of different crops. It's just one of those viruses that are super common and can go get into a lot of species. And this beet leafhopper is like basically the only vector of this virus. Mm. And they become really common, like because we know their life cycle, we know, and we, we also see because this is when people get hit in like California, for example, they will, uh, they will come out of the like um, the mountains and the sort of chaparral uh, brush and stuff like this. And so actually some plants, some of these non-cultivated plants, they can have the B. curlitop virus and they have no symptoms. They're not affected. It's there in the plant, but they have no problem. And so if you're a cultivator and you're even just relying on these, like these curly top symptoms to like, be like, okay, that's a weed plant that has it. Let me call it so that it doesn't come and affect my plants. Well, it doesn't matter because you won't be able to see every single plant that has it. Meanwhile, the new generation of the leafhopper comes down, drinks the phloem sap, takes up the virus, which could be any number of strains, which have sort of different uh, various intensities as well for different species too. So there's that factor on top of it. Like a code. Just to double check this on my own knowledge base, because again, I, this is me just researching, you know, I find a problem, I research it, try to I try to provide an adequate answer to a solution. So when you're talking about the, the vectors, to my understanding, the aphid is the only one that can do a vector because it punctures it with its with its needle. Is that is are you we talking the disease or the, the virus we're talking about right now is are we talking about the aphid transferring that, or is it another bug that transfers that virus? Beetle, I believe. Uh, no, so so you're close. I mean, that's true. So aphids are prob are definitely they're definitely the one of the group, most. They're the group of insects that is the most responsible for specifically viral transmission, and it is because their mouth parts have adapted to be like incredibly precise. They weave, they penetrate through the, the skin of the plant. And then they have this like tongue essentially that, that moves through the individual cells and is looking for the phloem sap, the sieve elements. And so that's where it, it basically, and then what happens is it just lets that stuff go in. The, the, the pressure differential is so great uh, for such a small thing that it just shunts right into its body. Yeah. It doesn't have to like try to get that into it. And because of that, that makes viral transmission like it's amazingly great. Like you don't even necessarily damage individual cells. Sometimes you do, but yeah. So, so insects that have a similar kind of stylet like leaf hoppers, which like are leaf, that's related. what I was wondering right there. Exactly. It's leaf hoppers don't puncture it though, but they can transfer, they can transfer. Well, they the, do puncture it, but they don't, they do not, not quite in the, so they both, they, all of them feed on phloem. So all the hemitera are like, they're in this greater group and they all have this like piercing mouth part and aphids are part of a group called uh, like the aphid, aphidodia or the sternorinca. And the sternorinca group is where you get, I believe that's also white flies. Uh, I might be wrong there, but um, there's a greater group that the aphids are part of and they have close relatives that also have these stylus, but all of them have a piercing mouth part. And so, but it's the aphids, the leaf hoppers, the psyllids, uh, are another big group that that also vector like bacteria too sometimes as well like phytoplasmas the third one's the white furry ones right that kind of creates a fur like a uh, on the leaves like a wax like a, yeah exactly is that well, white, white flies can kind of do that with their like waxy bodies but like scale insects for uh, maybe example, i'm thinking scale maybe i'm bugs, thinking scale like mealybugs like mealybugs mealy bugs have that waxy coating yeah is that the is that the third family that you were discussing right there no, uh, like the psyllids. Do you the mean, psyllids. Or? Yeah. What type of bugs are those? 
So scale, so so the eight, actually, you know, um, you know, if you want me to, can I share my screen? Yeah, please. Uh, this, this is what our goal too, is to research some of the words you're saying and then share our screen so other, uh, other followers can be following along. So this, I, I made on the Future Camp project, I, I do, a, or I'm starting to do a series of videos about different kinds of pests. And I also have pest primer videos on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. But this slide was from one of those presentations about rice root aphids. And I included, because I always like to do this, there's sort of like evolutionary context. Why are aphids so good at what they do? Because it gives people the idea, it allows people to kind of form, I think, informed decisions. And farmers, cultivators are some of the most clever people I've ever experienced. And I feel like people can generally understand, even if, if you put it in a simple way, like, for example, so if they're similarly related, certain compounds are also going to have maybe similar effects. And if they're more distantly related, certain compounds we, we find, so this is corroborated with experiments, so that they're, they're not necessarily going to affect each other. So if you're armed with even that basic knowledge, like here, the, uh, the aphidomorpha, right? Those are the aphids and their similar organisms are very closely related. This is a, what do we call a phylogenetic tree. It shows an ancestry of different groups. And so when you categorize them because they're closely related genetically, it just opens you up to like knowing, well, okay, I can see that like if you were trying to see, will this virus or this pathogen, is it more likely or less likely that this other organism, you know, can take it up or have similar physiological reactions to like a biocontrol that you're trying to use? this might help you out because usually those genes are conserved, like immune system genes and stuff. So anyways, I'm getting in the weeds, but basically uh, the coccids- uh, It's 100% fine. Please continue. This is very interesting. Okay, cool. I appreciate it. So these coccids, the coccidomorpha, those are scale insects, but like that's a common term, scale insect, right? And in that group, that greater group, you've got armored scales and you've got- soft scales, what we call armored and soft scales. I don't have that here delineated, but basically mealybugs are in the, um, I think it's the soft scale group. And so they're a special kind of soft scale. And anyways, um, so, they, so you can see that they kind of branch off earlier, but they are in a close, you know, they're very close, they're more closely related <clears throat> than like, for example, these guys over here in this other branch. So you've got the the Elideromorpha, which are the white flies that you talked about earlier, and the psyllids, the psyllodia. So, so the psyllids and the white flies, they aren't super closely related because you see you have this branch back here, but they are more closely related to each other, you could say, than the scale insects and the aphids are, for example. Does it go and by like is... the build of their exoskeleton? So like that's the more so that's morphology and a lot of times morphology can be super helpful for general things, but morphology has also um, misled us in the past, uh, taxonomists and things like that. That's why genes and gene-based phylogenetic trees have become so useful and important for people. Yeah, but, but, but essentially a lot of times, like for example, I know something's a scale insect because um, it has these different features, but like in some contexts, the reason a lot of things will have similar features because they are not just related, but because they exist in the same environment. So there's convergent evolution. Like honeybees have fly, have wings, and an albatross has wings, but they're very different kinds of wings. But you yeah. can have two different species of bee that look almost identical or are identical. But the only difference is like if we take their genes and we can see that they're diverged or Sometimes it's like behavioral things that you don't, but you aren't able to see it visually. Anyways. How many of these bugs can transfer, um, tell me if I'm saying this right, transfer vector or is it, it does vectors only go for it with aphids, but which, which one of these can transfer the viruses? So the, um, the aphids are a big one. The psyllids are are sort of are not. Can you show us? Could you show us on that diagram one more time? Just oh ones? yeah. So basically, these aphids, the aphid group, and the um, the uh, the psyllids are a big vector for like bacteria, like phytoplasmas and things. I but remember I seeing viruses. their thing. <laughs> I remember they have a horn that they on their butt, right? They they stab, or how do they pierce the the cell wall to transfer the the this, bottom one? 
the psyllids have a mouth part too. Oh, it's a mouth part. It was a, it was yeah. A, yeah. Okay. The um, but yeah, so those those the aphids are a big one, and then the leaf hoppers aren't aren't they're they're over here, they're in the fagoromorphs. They're in the um, they're in a totally different group. So they've branched way earlier. They're in the orarinka or, or something like that. So the sternorinka, so the sternorinka and the uh, the arinka or I think I'm forgetting a symbol or a, a syllable there, but basically those two prefixes refer to the position of the mouth part on the head, I believe. So like rhynchus, like rhinoceros, that's like the nose, right? So oh, anyways, cool. yeah, hmm. so so that's just Latin. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to know that to know, you know, uh, what you're looking at here. It's still every. It's the fun thing about education. Once you, once you start learning, and you enjoy it. It all of it somewhat becomes interesting. You mentioned something earlier, actually, about uh, you. You've heard of Elaine Ingram, right? I do know Elaine Ingram. Uh, Elaine Ingram. So I've heard her say this, um, and you said this too, right? And I've heard this over the years where bugs are getting worse. They're getting uh, not. I want. I want to stay away from their strength, but. They're getting worse and they're getting more frequent. And you've probably, you've heard the same thing, right? I, I've heard that from a lot of people. And I was wanted to hear your thought process around uh, Elaine. I've heard her say that bugs get tr- attracted into the area because the soil is deplete of, of minerals. And I was wondering, do you think these bugs are, more bugs are being attracted into the area because the soil is being depleted of trace minerals. I, I could see where that could have an effect, but I don't know if that's the proximate reason. Like for example, if a plant is- um, Because the bugs would replace the minerals. That's my thought process. When they die, whatever they eat, they're re- they, my thought is that they are leaving behind the trace mineral that the soil is also needs or whatever the bacteria or the whatever that's missing. That was my thought process. Like kind of like, um, like they would feed on the plants and then die, and then their bodies More like how a microbe would when they die. Exactly, right. and it would re, yeah, restore the soil in a sense. Uh, it would keep attracting enough stuff until it was no longer interesting to them. But by that time, it's because their like arthropods or their skin or their poop, all that stuff is regenerating things. Is have you guys talked about any of that? Because I hear you guys say these things, but I don't know if that's what you're saying or if that's what I'm hearing. You know, and on top of that, I have found that when I, especially when you're dealing with somebody who has a reputation or any th- or, or any sort of credibility or, or fame or presence, I should say, maybe more neutrally, basically what I'm trying to say is if somebody has hurt, like there are people who attribute what other people say and then they'll like extrapolate. And I, I'm certainly guilty of it myself, but sometimes I've heard people say something and then I go to talk to the person who had said it and they'll cite that person. And then that person says, no, I didn't say that. Or that's not quite what I meant. So sometimes we even misinterpret that too. But like, for example, I, what you're describing makes sense, right? So if you have an input of this organism that's made up of all these elements, right? And they'll like feed on the plant or whatever, like in aggregate, it's, it's kind of like the water cycle, right? Like the water, you have it in the lake and then the water dehydrates. And then, you know, that you have this like cycling of the, the water. And of course, this all happens in another way. But I mean, to this, so that statement is kind of vague, right? Like, does the mineral or does the lack of like elements attract the insects? Well, the things that attract insects or like herbivorous insects are what they see. Like, because like to answer that question, I would maybe I'm biased. Glow. Well, like for their... Um, like how does it like for example I have a video on my channel how do how do insects find their healthy how healthy plants and eat them like what what are they doing so there's like it's it's an abstraction to say to go from like insects come somewhere because mineral depletion right I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that right but but so what they would do is they would use their eyes to see uh, a plant right they have to. They have to have vision. There's, so there's visual cues, olfactory. So there's scent, the ability to pick scent, scent up, gustatory cues, especially with things like aphids, right? So they use all of these cues to find suitable hosts. Um, they kind of check for a bad immune system, right? Well, to it's kind of, to an extent, right? So like, for example, and this is where I was going to go with this, I would definitely agree with the statement that if it was worded slightly differently, 
like for example so like if you have some sort of a dysfunction because certain elements aren't there or especially in, a, in an ecological context where i think people have this bias that like sort of a fairy tale interpretation of forests that they're all like all these creatures living in harmony everyone's cool there's no problems when in fact it's actually a massive death match between plants trying to outshade each other that's why in, in experiments you ask do people look at this sort of stuff absolutely they do and there's there's interesting ecological theory about like sort of um what we what we've termed um shade avoidance syndrome in plants so there's some they're, very they're, uh, they're constantly kind of like fighting not fighting but they're competing with the their root system and their microbase with the other ones correct to try to gain that stop that dominance Exactly. And I mean, for some plants, this matters more than others. Some are more adapted to, and of course, and we're talking, a lot of times we're talking agricultural context, which is very far removed from the natural selection pressures, not totally, but, but very, you know, you know what I mean? So like, we're making a bunch of abstractions about, and that's why I like to couch things in ecological sense, so that you can contrast, so you can see, well, this happens in nature, and it may also happen in an agricultural setting. And certain aspects of that behavior or symbiosis might be more intense because of agriculture uh, or, or how you're growing your plants, I should say. And some of them might be re more reduced because of the things that you're doing, like hygiene and sanitation, like a lot of pathogenic fungi, you know, they develop these, these uh, adaptations in an environment where people aren't like taking the leaves and like composting them, right, for example. So like, like providing them a dirty apartment. Yeah. Yeah. So like the inocula that would be in the dried and desiccated and destroyed leaves. Some of them might even be processed by like, you know, micro arthropods in the soil and that kind of a thing. But like by and large, they probably did a lot better in those environments. But, but in an agricultural setting, we might disrupt that just as a natural aspect of how you grow and cultivate. Sometimes that's not intentional. Sometimes people know that that's a problem and they're intending to have that effect. You know what I mean? So, so it, basically coming back to your question, if you have all this competition and the soil is poor in one way or another, or there's these other competing factors and that ultimately results in a plant that is already stressed in various ways. And maybe there's also other factors to, to consider like genetically or whatever, but yeah, uh, if you're if you're getting some chlorosis because like another fungus is attacking the plant and shutting off some xylem channels and all these other things, yeah, like the, like there's a reason why we have yellow sticky cards because they pick up on the yellow and that yellow is chlorosis, but that's like uh um, but you have to look at the cause and effect, right? The cause is over millions of years it's been adaptable, <laughs> it's been more adaptive for for an herbivorous insect, a lot of them to hone in on the yellow color because they tend to do better on it but they also care about the green because that's what tells them it's a plant too so you brought up something really interesting right there and again i don't have a proper education so it's like i could say whatever i want and just walk away you guys it's on the line with for you guys it's a joke when i say that but uh, no you're right though but you are right <laughs> yeah. it's a good point yeah it's true okay um but so I'm just going to say something again, might sound really stupid. Please put it into good jargon for us, if it makes sense. But sure. so the yellow and I, I was thinking about it earlier, how birds find their way, right? They have like this internal compass in their mind. They have like a, a natural type, a magnet, right? Exactly. Do bugs have something similar to where it, instead of them, like, I guess what they see through their eyes, like, do they are, do they see the plant or do they see a, a frequency or vibration, right? Because if the light, if the sun is coming down and hitting the solar panels and it's creating a prism in a sense of a frequency through those leaves and those and the leaves and the plant store minerals all throughout the plant, whether they're mobile or immobile. And if they're, if the minerals are depleted and the sun is coming down in a sense, creating a, a frequency or, or I've heard in multiple, a, a prism or whatever, is the bug actually being attracted to the plant possibly through kind of like an infrared site, you know, like I want to call it infrared, but it's seeing it 
it's seeing it through colors and it's it's able to detect through oh you know it's like a, if you if you have a heat gun right and everything's cold and there's a red it's something's right in the center do bugs look at it like that like where it's just like seeing and it's like oh you know that's that's heat like sense. yeah exactly do they do you know does that make any sense at all what i'm saying or uh it's not quite as as i understand it it's not quite like what you say it does actually sound a lot like a um uh something called the um uh, vibrational theory of olfaction but that would be olfaction not vision but it's this idea which is not supported i guess by the literature this has actually been a very this has been something postulated for like more than 100 years maybe more than 200 years about uh insect vision and or olfaction which is the idea that like that like molecules that are vibrating to give off ir right ir this background there's ir radiation and mm -hmm. so the insects use either their antennae or perhaps their eyes uh, there are other there are versions of this that have evolved over this time period and they um basically that they're able to detect these wavelengths through the vibrating and so that and so people who say that maybe it's olfaction that there's olfactory receptors in their antennae and that those antennae are basically picking up these IR frequencies. But I guess apparently, according to, and I've read the literature in like the 1960s and 70s, uh, a gentleman named Philip Callahan was very prominent in, 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 in saying that he very much thought that this was the case. As far as I can tell, he didn't actually do any experiments that would confirm this. And I guess other physicists also thought that there wasn't really a basis for it. And one of the major issues, I, I, as I understand it, I remember, I didn't make a video on this or anything, but maybe I should, because it's kind of a fascinating idea. But I guess there's so much background infrared radiation already that it would make it very difficult to sort of take it, sort of see it. There'd be a lot of what we basically visual noise or perhaps vibration yeah, interference noise. yeah I exactly guess like i guess what mark's trying to also say is like do they know a plant is some, like there's something wrong with it before they can actually get to it so that way so it's like kind of wasting less energy and time on their part too so if they have like a, a proxy. i don't know like, like mm -hmm. yeah exactly like some, yeah. something to be able to tell no. like low bricks even like where they are able to host that plant now and through like maybe time they could have created some sort of sensory factor like you're talking about uh, olfactory factor or something where they're able to get that cue off of that plant without having so you know. so so going forward yeah so basically insect vision is super variable depending on the the order and species and things and so we understand sort of a fraction about that and we have certain model organisms but basically a few hard and fast rules is that uh, insect vision and arthropod vision in general is very, very poor resolution. And a lot of insects do not see the range of colors that we do. And they also oftentimes, as we understand how their eyes work, it seems to be the case that shades can sometimes not even be, like we can, they can't even necessarily tell. They're also uh, how slow to motion. This. What? Aren't they also kind of slow motion? Like their their speed is almost different, like in their, lane, in oh. their, their lenses? Yeah, I mean, I think that also really depends on the insects. So like, like, you know, uh, stereotypically a fly or cockroach can uh, react very, very deftly, whereas like aphids are kind of lumbering, not super reactive. Uh, the leafhoppers we talked about earlier are incredibly vagile and swift, and they can, and they'll just like, they'll evacuate before you even get close to them. Yeah, um, not like so a fungus gnat where they're like clumsy. Yeah, like like a, a hummingbird. A hum no way a hummingbird interprets life the way we interpret it when it can flap mm -hmm. its wings and go as fast as it goes in any and and in any direction. Right. And like um, but like so they also have their they have their compound eyes that do a lot of that sort of visual um so a lot a lot of insects see green, yellow, or um red or a um and usually in ultraviolet, there's usually cones for like three colors, but like, it's so hard to, you can't equivocate it with human vision, human and mammalian vision generally is so much fundamentally different that it almost becomes very difficult to say, talk, to simplify it without becoming like, without saying the wrong thing. Uh, but they also have- or Becoming the bug itself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, like a lot of insects also can see polarized light, which we don't, I don't think we have, or if we do, we see it in a very limited way. What is polarized light? 
So that's light where basically there's a uh, rotation to, I think, if I understand, if I remember correctly, um, the particles. So what happens is that it sort of, and we don't, I don't, again, we don't really see polarized light. So I can only describe it in like a theoretical sense. But um, a lot of times polarized light comes from the sun or from reflections. So like when the, when the light bounces off of a surface, it yeah. can change the polarity. And so an insect would use that information that could be very useful if you're i don't know flying you or at expect, nighttime too right or at nighttime mm -hmm. or if you're trying to find which way was up yeah that's yeah. very are interesting you, yeah i can see familiar that. with are you familiar with uh sugar sugar signaling pathways within plants like that particular network sugar signaling yeah there's like certain there's like a sugar sugar signaling pathway network within the plants so like when they come across something like a complex sugar like an oligosaccharide it emits a response within the plant where it has like a mRNA response so where it kind of has a code that comes in and then it, through like evolution, it's gained this response. So that way it, it picks up its uh, metabolism. It starts producing more antioxidants and then it also kicks up its uh, immune system. And I've, I've looked at a bunch of uh, studies on this in actual papers, but I didn't know if a, a lot of studies are showing that that's a, a way to help fight against like to, for pest resistance and uh and uh, virology within plants. Like they said, so it like, acts almost like a vaccine in a sort. Well, so like sugar, um, I imagine like there's, well, I wasn't quite sure what you were referring to because plants definitely have to understand where not only just their own photosynthate is coming from. It's, but like, it, it's like an oligosaccharide. Sure okay. So uh, I, don't know, I can send you something after if you want to look you, at it. You, but uh, did you have a question about the, um, the interplay you, between like, you were also well, I didn't know if you knew. Well, yeah, I didn't know if that had anything to do with it because they're, sh they're showing that when plants have low amounts of certain types of sugars within them, that they they uh, carry themselves a certain way. So I didn't know if that was something that because we were going along like what the what the the bugs can sense and see or something like that. So I I didn't know one. I was trying to see if you knew about the sugar signaling pathway and whether those type of low sugar levels would be well, something which that one? Plants which one that. specifically are you referring to? So one specifically that I'm looking up is it's an oligosaccharide, and that 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 comes in forms of like a like a bio. Is that what is that like what the path, is that what the pathway is called? It's under sugar signaling pathway network, and that, it, that's what the studies were under. And uh, it, they were showing how there's an mRNA mRNA type of response, like a vaccine for the plant, like when it gets that certain type, when it comes in contact with that type of sugar, it doesn't uptake it, but it receives it like a code, and then when it gets that code it creates that response within itself to be able to create more antioxidants within itself to help then create more aminos or uh, put more aminos towards, sorry. Just to, to add on to this, what Hayes is saying, because I've also have a curious question. I've heard multiple times that the sugar actually doesn't stay a sugar. It, it constantly is adjusting the, the, the sugar molecule, like the bacteria. Like the, the moiety of the sugar? Again, I'm I'm a simple minded. Sorry, yeah. No, like, you, like, but like the, I hope the, I, the shape, right? The shape, the shape is the, constantly yeah. adjusting and changing. And I'm wondering, I, as I listen to Hayes, I'm wondering, is is that what you're kind of describing too, Hayes? These constantly adjusting sugars. So this is a specific. It's a long chain. Uh, it's a long chain. So it has, it's like a like third. I would say like a chain of thirteen different types of. Uh, you know, we, we're going we'll to have drop it on the terminology right now. But uh, what, what it does is when it comes across, it, that's what chitosin oligosaccharide is too. So when, when the exoskeleton of the bug is broken down to that sugar, it has, some of them have oligosaccharides along with that chitosin. And that's that type of sugar that elicits the response within that plant, I guess. And that's what they were finding. And uh, it, it's mm. present in the chitosin after the, after the bugs are broken down. And then it's also present in fermented plant extract as like a biostimulant. So, so the sugar, so the chain, possibly, I'm not trying to connect it to what I was saying, but possibly it, the change. It doesn't uptake it. it. The changing in the sugar molecules is stimulating the. So it has like an ancient response from evolution, I guess, so where it came into contact with that before. So it, it sends a code to that root that is coming in contact with something. And then through that code, it's, uh, it's eliciting responses within itself, kind of like when we get a vaccine shot and it's giving us Let, a little bit of that 
that let's virus, go to the... we're able to create a response. Sorry. No, it's okay. Let's go to the next question. We'll, we'll, let's go to the next question. Sorry, Sometimes Matt. You... Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I mean, I, I have a response to something kind of close to that. I go ahead, say, please. Okay. No, yeah. please. Absolutely. So, It'll... sure. Um, basically, uh, so I, I think that I'm not totally sure exactly how this is working. I'm happy to take a look at what you're talking about. I'm, I'm very curious. I know that, um, like, for example, not just like the, the sugars that the, the plant produces itself, but like, there's a whole, there's a whole, like, there's a massive milieu of like things that plants uh, produce, like in their mucilage and the roots. And there are reactions to like, for example, what, what are often called like damage associated molecular patterns, which I think is what you're sort of talking about it's, um, it, it's along that yeah yeah maybe not the exact same thing but the idea that like essentially like with our own immune system plant cells they have receptors and those receptors internally and externally you know they will bind with certain things so, and a lot of those things are associated with like a pathogen and maybe even like a beneficial what we would call a beneficial which is again an abstraction right so like what will happen is kind of like what you're saying, like a, a sugar molecule or a, uh, a protein of some kind or an enzyme, perhaps even an enzyme that's uh, nominally used by a pathogen to suppress the immune system, an effector can be bound. And then there's a, there's a plant cell response that goes, oh man, like I'm, of course I'm simplifying it, but it goes, oh man, I need to make a change. I need to upregulate this gene and produce more of this protein and there's like this complex arms race that happens between insects and the microbes inside their gut and the microbes inside the plant and the microbes on the plant and the microbes around on the roots. And all of these things are constantly changing the plant's physiology. So yeah, I mean, in that way, I would definitely agree. Okay. Yeah. Cause from what I was reading, it was saying that it's a really good way to just get, not just yield out of your plant, but the whole protection against pathogens or, or oncoming pests that you may come across. And the, the main research comes from Canna, from that nutrient company Canna. And then it, it started going down to them distinguishing that to the, the single oligosaccharide that the plants have in a response to. It's creating a better metabolism for the plant. And then whenever it comes through a speed bump, it's able to just go through it. And uh, I use stuff like that. And it, it's just pretty much breaking down the, the, the why ferment, fermented <clears throat> plant extracts work and why I'll throw out using like insect press work because it breaks down to that simple to that complex sugar at the end and is able to elicit that response from the plant on top of having those almost type of humic reactions from mm. the so, I, I hate to even throw this question out because I want but every time that sugar molecule evolves is it's not just ATP right it, it when that sugar molecule evolves it doesn't it become a new molecule that was, but we don't have the when answer it, that. When it, what do you mean? Um, I, I think when it changes, when it changes its um, shape. When it changes its shape, doesn't it no longer be, be, become ATP, but it becomes something else? Because I don't, I don't, again, I'm not a scientist, but I don't, that never makes sense to me. How can a molecule adjust its shape and then it is still a adenosine triphosphate. And oh, so the sugar, to me. it doesn't happen that way. The sugar basically gets metabolized and through through that metabolism, that and a bunch of other chain reactions happen. And, and that causes the sort of the, the system that includes a, the creation of ATP to, to happen, essentially. Uh, I, I, I don't really, to be honest, I don't even know, like there's a simplified version of this process that people could maybe talk about, but as they say, the, the model is not the, the reality. The map is not the terrain. There are other aspects that we're still investigating, um, but it's very complex. But yeah, basically that sugar molecule is going to be used to create the chemical energy that allows the, the production of ATP to, to occur. And that's why photosynthesis is so useful to the plant because you're harvesting the the energy of that photon that hits the plant and the chlorophyll and that sort of creates this chain reaction or allows that chain reaction to, to keep going, if that makes sense. A hundred percent. Let's go ahead and dive into the next question was how important is clean water to IPM? I mean, I would say it's essential. Um, like uh, for example, and depending on what you mean, 
like uh, you don't want to have some sort of a toxin or a contaminant, of course, in like your water when you're irrigating. Certainly, are there bacteria that build up in the limes that you that you come across yeah, a lot? That can definitely happen. Yeah, biofilms and things like that. Uh, for I I worked with a grower of Gerbera daisies for a very long time, eight years or so, and these greenhouses were built in like the um, I think early to mid seventies originally. And their valve and irrigation system hadn't changed fundamentally. And I remember they were That's dealing, they, they were constantly dealing with like, because we would basically, they'd have people who had to like undo the valves every week and just like, you know, eject this like microbially rich um, <laughs> sludge essentially. And yeah, it was it was very if bad. People like, only knew what goes on in on the farms. Yeah. People would start growing their own food. I can almost guarantee well, you that. For, these were for these were for flowers. Like these are all grown for a market that will appreciate them for a couple of weeks and then just throw them in the trash. And also if you don't sell them by a certain date, you, you throw them in the trash because you can't do anything with them. And I'm not bitter. You're bitter. Like, I just feel like there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of nutrients and resources maybe used for, I mean, you know, no offense to them. I understand a pretty flower costs effort and resources and stuff, but at the same time, we just felt like it could have been used to food or something. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm too utilitarian in that way, but, um, but yeah, like, like, and they had constant like fusarium was a big one. And now they did the plants didn't always show, signs or symptoms of having the pathogen or if they did they were kind of low but anyways to get back to your point clean water is super essential and um it's like basic hygiene for um for for keeping your for being able to if you are going to adulterate it adulterate it in the way that you want so you don't have to deal with any weird factors or anything like that we have a product uh called drops balance i would love to get it over to you uh, if that's okay with you maybe send it out to your pillbox and maybe you can play around with it it's it's the product cleans uh so far it cleans over 4500 man-made chemicals uh to non-detectable levels of pesticides fungicides heavy metals all those types of things and it reverts them back to sulfate minerals uh, and it adds trace minerals back to the water uh, so if you're okay with that, I'd love to uh, send it out to you. Maybe play around with it. Sure. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and also a uh, pesticide, uh, because whenever I find a couple of products, I'm like, I don't just push them, but I'm like, okay, we need to get these products to the forefront. Uh, have you ever heard of Organishield? I have. What do you think about it? I know people, I think, who have used it for good effect, but to be honest, I I forget what the uh, what the added ingredient is. Well, it. You know what? I it's. I'm going to get you a sample out. I'd love to, I would, for you being in your position, I don't want to push a product that is going to create more problems, you know, and I've examined this, this product and a whole bunch of different levels. And I think it's like, I think it's like the pesticide and fungicide of the future. Seriously. Um, on that clean doesn't create, doesn't, it, it, it kills the things you need to breaks down, Yada yada, but I'll get it. Both these products in your hand. So tell me what you think about it. Like, give me a hardcore opinion about it because I love to get good feedback. Is that okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. I appreciate that. So the next question is, uh, and help me out with this, Hayes. Uh, with the with these two words, I I, I kept screwing up on it. Uh, what? Bastiana? Yes, exactly. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> so it's a it's a cordyceps fungus. Believe it or not. And it, uh, it's a pathogen of insects and sometimes other arthropods, but uh, basically it, uh, it infects plants kind of like how, kind of like how botrytis infects plants. It affects insects the way that botrytis infects plants in that there's a spore, the spore adheres to the surface. There are basically, you know, it, it germinates. It can tell what it's on with the hyphae. And when it realizes Oh, this is a this is a suitable host. It creates a, a penetration peg. It penetrates through the cuticle, penetrates through the tissues, releases a bunch of uh, enzymes and proteins that break down the exoskeleton and also the uh, sort of epidermis of the insect. And 
basically spreads more hyphae and suppresses the immune system more and just like de denatures, like literally on a chemical level, it, it, it enzymatically degrades the exoskeleton. So it's basically like a mummy. Like, yeah, well, it's like uh, pouring acid, you know, into the, into the, into the exoskeleton. And uh, then it, it just like colonizes from the inside out and then you get this mycosis and then it creates a bunch of spores. And then those spores go on to infect other, uh, usually, especially nearby insects. So it's a pretty nice uh, biocontrol agent. Hmm. Through, through you even have like fruiting bodies coming out of the ants. It's crazy. I, well, yeah, for, for those cordyceps, absolutely. These ones tend to just make little, um, oh. like almost like molds. But yeah, it's so it is cordyceps. cordyceps. It is. It's um, okay. Well, it's so fungal taxonomy is super complicated, but basically, uh, the, apparently, many Bouveria genera are also like I think it's the it's the sexual form I think of certain cordyceps. Hey, do you have a question? Sorry. I was just Talk gonna say you. through through many documentaries and stuff that I watched, uh, it's an extremely interesting fungi, and from what I see, nature did a really good job with checks and balances where specific ones actually will attack a certain type of ant or a certain type of caterpillar. Um, there was one that when it infects an ant, it actually like alters its mindset. The ant actually starts climbing up like a branch clamps on. And then all of a sudden the fungi takes over, puts out the spores to the colonies. So is there any being that it's from my research, it seems like there's very specific ones. Is there any that you for in terms of agriculture, like products that are currently out that are reliable, like for aphids, or is there one that's uh, more of a spectrum of a specific species of bugs, or is it as uh, specific as I as I've as I've observed? Or no, that's a great question. And actually, uh, just a small correction for a lot of the cordyceps fungi that sort of like seemingly like uh, control the mind of their hosts, like with ants and things. Very recent research this year and last year came out about um, some of those groups. And apparently it's not a mental or sort of a neur neuronal effect, but it actually is taking control of the muscles mm -hmm. of the um, of the prey, a like the ants and things. Yeah. And a real parasite. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty it's pretty bizarre. And to be honest, I don't remember the research off the top of my head enough to talk about it in more depth. But basically that was what they found out was the case. And I think that like, like puppeteering you like a marionette is maybe even worse. I think I got one, I got one for you, uh, Matthew. I don't know if you've ever heard of this in your, in your circle. Um, Adam and Eve and the snake, you know, that, that story, right. In the Bible. Sure. Sure. And the tree of life or the Kabbalah. Well, do you know this, how the, and I don't use the tree of life, I, but basically the tree of life or the, um, our gut system and the snake, uh, the representation of the snake is not a, the snake around the tree of life and Adam and Eve. It's actually the parasites that live in our gut and basically is circulating around the tree of life and our tree of our life is our gut system. And they talk about how, the story is that the parasites in our gut system alter our thinking and influence our thought process, basically. And it's it's and it's kind of interesting what you're saying, how they you know attach themselves to the, these muscles and the and these things happen. You know, ants crawl up the hill, and I saw that documentary. Maybe Dave saw sent. I think Dave sent me that document, the same one. I, I was very interesting, and different things happened. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And that's fantastic fungi. It, maybe it was, yeah. The, have was you the, saw that? I don't know if it was the one I sent you with the parasite that it infects mice, where it act, the mice Oxoplasmosis? actually- Oxoplasmosis? Yeah, and where it yeah. wants to go to the cat. And, and even the process, like the mouse has to be eaten by the cat. All the processes happen internal, internally in the cat for it to eventually go affect another mouse to run toward another cat. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then there was even studies where they're studying people with- that take, um, they're more risk takers, you know, why don't they have fear with this one more? And they're starting to study the brains. And I think they even, they found it in one of the scientists's, um, you know, he yeah. had it, you know, yeah. actively in, in his brain and he was a more of a risk taker. So, um, totally what you're saying is 
And like, why, why I've went out with all my ex girlfriends, <laughs> right? Why do I attract crazy ones? Not there, um, okay, that, guys. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, no, I see because I just want you guys going off topic here. I know how you guys get when you uh go back to the classroom. Good evening, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm doing well. The I guess the last question we had was uh, what plant viruses are brought in from bugs? And I guess we kind of covered that a little earlier. Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, it's interesting. I can actually segue what you just said into what you just said again with this question, which is that, believe it or not, there's a silverleaf whitefly out there. It's a very common pest, and it's a super vector of over 480 plant viruses uh, known. And um, one of them is the tomato yellow Dwarf, I, I actually forget exactly the name, but essentially there's a there's a virus that it um, transmits, and it actually changes the bias that it has for yellow leaves because it, what it does it gets into the insect and then it literally damages the neurons responsible for this sort of color bias, and so it literally like you know mentally destroys part of its brain. And what then was it that, called? Yellow fire. Leaf curl virus, tomato yellow leaf curl virus, I believe is it. Yeah. Does that look similar to that beet curl? A little bit, but it's a it definitely has a different. Um, a, a, there's a big overlap in range, but I think the one of them is a curdovirus and the other one's a tobamo virus, but they're they're sort of they're different enough. Um, but basically, this is uh, we don't really know how common this is, but um, and you, you even show uh, how infected bugs like like mites will even uh they'll piggyback on other bugs and then like the silver them. leaf white fly yeah broad mites yeah. will go on to the silver leaf white fly they're literally attracted well, you even had them on a grasshopper even didn't you you had some like on different bugs as well yeah some them. sometimes sometimes uh mites and for and, and things like that will sometimes they're parasites but sometimes they're just hitching a ride and um that kind of symbiosis can actually be beneficial for like uh carrion beetles and things because it actually helps them retain heat they're like a little mite sweater and um apparently it's uh apparently it's beneficial enough and of course the mites get some food when uh the beetles are finally done doing what they're doing yeah i mean it was scary because you, it was just like a bug that's already small itself and then it has like 15 or 20 backpacking along getting a piggyback on it and then going to different plants and dropping who knows how many off and then they're starting from there it's something, I don't know, a lot of us in the community probably wouldn't think of to pin it down to that. No, I get what you're, I get what you're saying. It's um, here. I think I have it right here. Guys, do you guys have any other questions? Mike, I know you had some questions around spider mites. This is once in a lifetime opportunity. Go ahead. Okay, Matthew. He's the pro pro. Yeah, straight up. <laughs> well, Matthew, hi, how are you doing? Listen, Matthew, I've been growing cannabis for, on three different continents for the last 30 years. And since I've been back in Canada, I've had an issue with mites. Now, my facility is very dry, uh, low humidity, 45, 50, because eh? I'm in Canada and in wintertime, the humidity is not, just not there. So um, now my question is, I've been controlling them indoors with chemicals and other things. I tried to use other bugs, but since I had so much of an infestation that it is I put in beneficial mites, I would never be able to control it enough to stop the damage. So I, I resort back to chemicals. Now, for the last couple of years, I've been bringing the crop outside. And after a month, the mites were gone because the outdoor environment would take care of it. But now for the last three seasons, the mites are still staying there. And I stopped using synthetic sterilizers for an organic and I'm getting less damage but the mice are still resisting. And uh, what kind of P what kind of IP would you suggest to me? Or do you have any, does that bring any thoughts up to you? And these are specifically which mice? Double spotted, the two black spotted, yellow black spotted ones. Yeah, the two spot spider mites. Yeah, so um, I just wanna start off by saying that you shouldn't feel too bad. The, the two spot spider mites like really, really well known for like hyper adapting to their hosts, they're probably the most promiscuous plant parasite, over 1,200 hosts, a ton of them. So they're really great. 
So at uh, doing that, which, which poses a problem to us. So even things like chemical agents and other sorts of things that we would apply that other people have applied in the past, they've become resistant to pretty easily. So dealing with them can be very difficult, even from a chemical agent standpoint. What are some of the products that you used before? Do you know off the top of your head? Well, I've been working. I've been working on this for a while and I've used a lot of home remedies and like I have a big production, so I'm not afraid to kill a few plants. It's not like I'm in a five by five or I have five plants. So I've done everything from peroxide to I use rubbing, I've used rubbing alcohol in the past. I use different acids. I've used nemic oils. Uh, and as a repellent, I've used uh, peppermint oil. Royal Penny um, extract, okay, that I've been concentrating. It works great for house grasshoppers. So now I don't know if it's because I'm running 28 facilities that that I'm going from one place to another. Um, the only way we were able to keep it under control is we developed a, a certain spraying schedule and we're rotating a lot of chemicals. And then when we try to do our best in vegetation and then we do a minimum up to four weeks in flower, and then that's it. We were stuck with what we got in the room, right? And every in between every harvest, I'm tearing everything down, changing the flooring, doing uh, steam cleaning everything, and uh, waiting six days and starting up again. So that's how I've been surviving. So um, at least in veg, I know a lot of people have great effect with uh, like wettable sulfur and things like that. Um, have you ever used a product like that? I've never used sulfur. Or well, as like va a vaporizing sulfur? No, like a micronized wettable agent. Yeah, that's so interesting. Like, not to like, bur not burning it, um, but like applying it in like a liquid form. Um, that can be really useful for a lot like of people. Although Sulfuric acid? Uh, no, just sulfur. Just elemental sulfur. Mm. Oh, so just taking the, taking the yellow and maybe grinding it up, making it more water soluble or something, and then just putting it, I mean, I guess sulfur will break down to make it water soluble. I'm not very familiar with using like a raw sulfur product and sort of um, doing that, doing it that way. I usually just rely on a, on a commercial product that's uh, produced. Mm. That doesn't mean that you couldn't do it potentially. Uh, I just don't know. Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to understand. I never heard someone doing that i thought it was interesting drops balance is a, is sulfur based as well and i just was interesting i was just thinking about the connection of how they did it so, so oh, yeah definitely so is um to the way i've been looking at because i'm i don't have any formal education i have been growing from experience i've learned how to read my plants so a lot of times when you talk about all these pathogens i understand what you're talking about but not at the same point level as you guys so what the way I see it through my eyes is that uh, the mites, there's three, two ways of killing them. There's suffocating them and, um, and using something that will stop the oxygen or uh, an acid that will actually melt the wax. That's the main part of the body. And uh, I have to stay in between the Canadian guidelines. Health Canada limits me to a certain amount of products. So what I, the way I, gotten the best results is that I've increased my spraying cycle. You know, the manufacturers are saying to spray every four or five days, but then I'm leaving the eggs uh, rehatch. I'm repopulating in between my spraying. So since I've been spraying every 48 hours for when I have only when I have an infection, I'll spray 48 hours, uh, every 48 hours for a, a 10 day period. And then I will space it out. And then I will go to the weekly preventive spray. And uh, I am keeping 90% of the population down, but as I don't keep the routine up, they'll, uh, they'll overpopulate me and uh, I'll get the negative effects. That makes so, sense because a lot of the botanical sort of pesticides you just mentioned, I know people who work who had great um, effect. I don't know exactly which products you use, but those active ingredients have worked well for me and others in the past. But I find that like the big, one of the things that makes or breaks those contact killers is like you said, either you're suffocating them or you're basically kind of like those enzymes I talked about earlier with the buberia, literally like melting the exoskeleton away with enzymatic action. So like you had somebody on the, on the show a little while ago, talked about like chitin 
and uh, chitinolytic enzymes like chitinase. So like that would be an example of that. But essentially, coverage is like the the it's the the queen of battle, as they say. Um, if you don't have actual coverage, or and these mice, you know, again, like don't beat yourself up about it. It's not surprising, like the foliage, all these little nooks and crannies. You only need one female to create uh, an infestation because they're a female that's not fertilized makes males. It mates with those males and it makes females. So you're, you're back at a colony again in within a couple of weeks. So I'm always right. wearing the same clothes in the same rooms. I'm always wearing the same clothes. So that seems to be working, but I just find that I, I just, did, did the bugs get stronger? Did it just adapt it to our, our Northern climate? Do you think? I mean, I'm sure that some of that is happening, but um, I think that like, so f- resistances like that are usually really um for lack of a better term, in the ecological context, we call it costly. Um, usually it's like a mutation, a point mutation. So there's something that like the chemical would normally bind to that it's not binding very well. And so, or in the case of spider mice, usually is the case, they're really well adapted already to detoxifying plant defenses and toxins that they produce and also uh, interrupting like what... Um, Hayes was talking about earlier, the plant's immune response and signaling. It, they're really great at just locally disrupting the hell out of it. And then generally that has like downstream effects. So in pretty short order, a colony can create havoc within the immune system of a plant because they have so many hosts that are so disparately related. They're really good at that. And so essentially... But, but but like if you kill if you use a product of the right like active ingredient amount that sort of a thing, even their detoxification or if you're or if you're suffocating them like you were saying it doesn't matter like they don't have a they don't have a response to that um, at least not in one generation if you know what I mean but sub con- consistent sub lethal uh, concentrations like like not very good coverage or you know, if like not the right amount of spray gets to them and they're able to overmatch it, that can have downstream effects on their progeny. And you're probably dealing with populations that are ambient in your area. They've been exposed to all kinds of stuff through like the last, you know, many decades of, of agriculture in your area. So at the end of the day, um, there are a lot, there, it's like football. Um, there's a few good, you know, there's a few plays. You just kind of have to rotate those plays and be very aggressive. And like you were saying, um, having a more aggressive frequency of application is oftentimes really important. Um, it can be very expensive though. And if you've used biocontrols like Persimilis, you know, I also find that that look, works really well, but also again, you have to apply it the right way and it can also be kind of expensive and usually have to apply multiple times anyways. I just had a question about like one spray that I saw. It was, it was by bug. It's by Garden Safe, and it uh, has a specific salt in there that disrupts the the nerves and the nervous system within the bug. Are those something that a bug would be able to get used to over time? I can't remember exactly what's in it, but oh, potentially, like a like like a great example are like the natural nicotinoids, uh, and also the synthetic neonicotinoids, and basically uh, those disrupt uh, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. So what happens is that it doesn't allow those bindings to happen. And so basically the insect can't, it literally can't move its muscles. So that means it can't feed. However, they can still look like they're alive, but they're dying. You know, they're like, they're okay. starving to death essentially is what's happening. And, but, but yeah, so there's two ways that insects resist that. The first way is through what's called a point mutation. Those things that they bind with, well, they change slightly or grammatically. And so those bindings don't happen, but that comes at a cost. And that's usually that other transmitters that it requires are also not working really well because they don't evolve like in unison. So um, that can sometimes be, basically it can come back. Like the, the mutation that the, the, the regular normal uh, binding that you're used to will come back if you don't apply a lot, a, a lot of times. The other way, which is also way more robust and difficult for us is that they have literal enzymes that just break that stuff down. And essentially that is way less costly and way more effective for the bugs. So, but it depends. A lot of bugs can do this, but it really depends on the species. 
Matthew, thank you so much for your time today. This uh, was an awesome interview, and I know we pulled a lot of gold nuggets through this. Guys, remember, only on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Have a great grow, everyone. And I guess my question would be, can you add pure RO water into an organic living soil or can it potentially strip minerals or, or hold on to it since it's so hungry or it has nothing in it to where even when you stir it, you know, the, it, it goes extremely acidic.